Good morning. Welcome to the third meeting of the Welfare Reform Committee for 2015. Could I ask everyone to please make sure that the mobile phones and other electronic devices are silent or switched to airplane mode at least. Uh, we go to agenda item one. The first item of business today is a decision on whether to take item three in private. Item three is a consideration of the evidence that we're about to receive from the Right Honourable David Mundell, MP. Are members agreed? Okay. That brings us to agenda item two, which is a discussion with the Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for Scotland. And before us, we have uh, David Mundell, MP, who is that Parliamentary Under Secretary. Uh, we also have Richard Cornish, the Devolution Director at the DWP and Pete Serrell, Strategy Director of Working Age Benefits at the DWP. Welcome to you all. Uh, this is the second time that we are able to welcome uh, David Mundell before us. He previously appeared on the 26th of June 2014 to discuss the issues of food banks and sanctions. And today we'll discuss the welfare proposals contained in the Smith Commission and the draft clauses. And then the meeting... Uh, which Mr Mundell has undertaken with our previous food bank witnesses. So we have about one and a half hour for both topics, and in my role as convener, I'll try and judge how best we can meet that target. Uh, but I would like to invite um, David Mundell to make some opening comments in relation to our first subject matter. I'll pass it over to you, uh, Secretary of State. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, convener, and uh, I'm very pleased to be uh, in, in the Scottish Parliament um, this morning. You've already uh, introduced uh, my colleagues, Richard uh, Cornish, uh, who is the uh, devolution uh, director in the Department of Work and Pensions, and Pete Searle, who is the strategy director uh, for working age uh, benefits, and they'll uh, support me uh, this morning and uh, on some of the more technical issues, we'll probably be able to give you some more uh, detailed uh, responses. Uh, I'll confine my initial remarks to the, to the Smith Commission and then make some further remarks in, in, for, uh, on this, the second uh, topic later in the meeting. I mean, obviously, quite a lot has happened uh, since uh, I last appeared uh, before uh, this committee on behalf of the Secretary of State for Scotland, who, of course, was unavailable uh, in June. We've had the referendum, uh, we've had the Smith Commission, we've had the publication of the clauses, and we've even had an old firm game. But it, it would be uh, timely to discuss the Smith Commission proposals, and I want to start with that. On the 22nd of January, the UK Government published the draft clauses to deliver the agreement reached by Scotland's five main political parties on the future of devolution within the UK, as set out in the Smith Commission Agreement. This was a major milestone reached in just 37 working days from the publication of the Smith Commission, but the work has only just begun. The task now is to get on with finalising the clauses and to have a full draft bill ready for introduction at the start of the new session after the next general election. In parallel with this, we need to continue work started to take forward the non-legislative changes set out in Smith. We've committed to do this whilst engaging with stakeholders who want to contribute uh, to the draft clauses and next steps on the non-legislative uh, side. Uh, the Prime Minister and the First Minister have made clear that uh, such engagement is critical ahead of the introduction uh, of any legislation. And as the Parliament to whom uh, these powers will be devolved and this committee for whom the welfare clauses will be of particular interest, I'm sure you will want to play a full part in that process. As I set out in my uh, letter to you last uh, week, a convener, following the inaugural meeting between the Prime Minister and the First Minister of Scotland, a joint ministerial welfare group has been uh, established, and I think you've already taken evidence from Alec Neal, who will co-chair uh, that group with me. The group will consider practical implementation and transitional issues around DWP programmes and will represent a forum for dialogue and resolution of welfare reform-related issues. In working together with the Scottish Government in this way, my objective is to achieve a smooth transition uh, of uh, new responsibilities identified by the Smith Commission by reaching a better understanding around our respective policy positions following publication of the draft uh, clauses. Uh, we hope that the first meeting of the joint uh, ministerial group will be uh, next uh, week, and I would hope that that group will uh, engage proactively with this uh, committee. 
Okay, thanks very much, um, Minister. Um, can I open up by, in terms of the technical uh, aspects of how we move this forward, we, the, the, I think it's important that we remember that, that we're talking about draft uh, proposals at, at the present time. How quickly do you envisage that we will start to see some crystallisation around where some changes or technical clarification might be required around those uh, um, proposals? Uh, there has been some concern that if the spirit of, of the Smith Commission has been kept, some of the, the technical um, considerations might not be as tight as some people would like them. And so when can we start to see how your thinking will be shaped on that? In relation to, to the Smith Com Commission proposals, the, the First Minister, Prime Minister agreed that the, the single priority coming out of, of the Commission uh, process in re relation to uh, the legislative process was actually the enabling of 16, 17 year olds to vote in next year's Scottish Parliament elections. And I know that's a separate matter from this committee, but uh, so that the, the, the the time window that was available uh, to allow that to happen is currently being used, and that is the tightest time window to get the necessary legislation through. And you may have seen that that uh, order was, was before the Westminster Parliament last night. So that by the time we reach our uh, dissolution on the 30th of March, the necessary legislation to allow that to happen uh, will have taken place. It, it, was, it is... It is absolutely clear that it is not possible to put forward any of the other proposals in that way, in that time scale. There simply isn't the time or resource window to allow that, uh, to, allow that to, to happen. I, I mean, clearly there have been a number of suggestions from the Scottish Government and others that certain aspects uh, of the Smith Commission recommendations uh, be uh, fast-tracked. Uh, clearly that can be uh, debated. The, uh, the government's view remains that it would be better uh, to proceed with, with a single piece of uh, legislation to be brought forward in the Queen's uh, speech, which would set out in, in terms of, of the legislative requirements. But there are lots of other things which are not legislative requirements, which can start right now, have started right now, uh, and uh, with, with direct engagement between DWP officials and, and, and Scottish uh, government officials. And in fact, uh, Richard uh, has been involved over the last few days in, in a number of those discussions. And perhaps you might just want to elaborate on that at this point, Richard. Yeah, uh, thank you. So we're already discussing uh, with Scottish government on a number of topics. Uh, so we've held sessions with officials on uh, personal independence payments, on employment programmes and shortly on universal credit. So uh, they're with an aim of uh, helping the Scottish Government officials understand a lot of the detail involved in, in those areas. Uh, we are also planning um, across the UK Government to hold a number of events uh, across Scotland to engage with Civic Scotland on the draft clauses uh, between now and the general election as well so that we can get further comments on, on the draft clauses. We've had, as you said, we've, we've had discussions with uh, the Cabinet Secretary, uh, Alex Neil about how we, we can shape the direction of uh, implementation uh, of, of the new powers. But already we've started to see suggestions that because a, a consensus has arisen around things like the work programme, mm -hmm. now we, we know that that's now been committed to for another period of time, but there is a consensus that, that people would like to, to be able to start to shape that here um, in Scotland as, as quickly as possible. So if we get suggestions like that and where there is apparent agreement um, that, that this type of power could come more swiftly uh, to the Scottish Parliament, is that in your thinking? Uh, could we have a Section 30 order to allow the, the devolution of the work programme to, to happen prior to the, the bigger piece of legislation that would have to come um, to uh, deliver the Smith Agreement? The work uh, programmes on the agenda uh, for the first meeting of, a, uh, of, of the joint group, but part of that discussion will be not just around the, 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 the transfer of, of responsibilities for the work programme, but we, we do need to have an understanding, I think all of us, uh, in both parliaments, both governments, uh, uh, as to what, you, what the transfer um, is to... Um, um, at this moment, 
I'm not clear, certainly DWP officials not clear, as, as to what the proposed alternative to the work program would be to transition to. And I think you know, that needs to also be part of, of, the, of the discussion, not just a, uh, when it's going to happen, but what is, what is it actually going to transition to um, so that we can uh, you know, look, look how that can be best, uh, best achieved. But you're not closing your mind to the possibility of something coming sooner than, than a, the it, legislation that we're talking it, about it, in general. It's not possible. It, it's not possible to uh, bring forward a Section 30 order ahead of the UK general uh, election. That there isn't enough time left within the parliamentary system. But I, my mind isn't closed to that uh, uh, as a possibility uh, in terms of post-election uh, d delivery of, of the Smith Commission proposals. Okay, I'll open up to colleagues. Kevin, you uh, Thank you, Convener. Um, uh, good morning, Minister. Um, the Secretary of State for Scotland uh, told BBC Sunday Politics Scotland that a duty to consult is in no way, shape or form a veto, and that, that have, had had a consultation, if the two governments take different views at the end of the day, then the Scottish Government is still entitled to go ahead with what they want to do. Do you agree with that statement in terms of dealing with new benefits? I do agree with that statement, and I think we've got evidence uh, of that being the case over the past few months when uh, the transfer was made uh, of the ability to set the cap for discretionary housing payments. A decision was made within the Scottish Parliament to allocate funds towards discretionary uh, housing payments. It was identified that... Uh, I, mean, I, I felt there were ways that other ways it could have been brought about, but the Scottish Government identified raising the benefit cap uh, as being the best way to achieve that. We had a discussion. I agreed with the then Deputy First Minister that that uh, would go forward, even though that was not the policy of the UK Government. And we, we took that forward. This committee has been part of that process. It, it, in a very uh, quick a time scale, and the Scottish Government now have responsibility for setting, uh, setting the cap, which will be different from, different from England and different from the, uh, different, uh, with a different policy objective of the UK Government. So it, you know, it's been done. We didn't veto it. We didn't say you can't do that because that's not our uh, policy. We respected the decisions uh, that had been uh, made, uh, and, and that will be uh, the approach, and I, I think the approach is the one that's set out in, in, in the Smith uh, uh, Commission of the two governments needing to work more closely together in areas where they have uh, joint responsibility. But given the decision of the Smith Commission was that re universal credit would remain reserved, there has to be a role for the Secretary of, of, of State, uh, for DWP, in, in the, the process with uh, the Scottish uh, Government. Could you give us some clarity on how long uh, a consultation between the two governments could go on for? Uh, well, over my uh, period um, in the Scotland office, uh, I've found that sometimes uh, these uh, matters can be resolved in hours and sometimes uh, they, they, they take considerably uh, longer. But I'm making it clear that uh, the, there is a goodwill uh, on uh, our part in terms of, of, of bringing these uh, uh, objectives uh, about. And, and what I'm heartened by... I, uh, firstly, was my meeting uh, the week before last with Mr. Neil uh, and officials and our own officials, and there was, you know, a collective view of let's make this let's make this work. So, can you confirm to the committee uh, that it would not be a matter of many years for uh, one of these consultations to be dragged over? <coughs> It would certainly, if, if, if it has anything to do with me, Mr Stewart, which of course I can't guarantee, it would not be a matter of years. Um, if it had anything to do with you, but uh, as you say, you can't guarantee it will be you. Um, could you con confirm that you know, uh, one of these consultations doesn't go on indefinitely, which is a veto in itself? Really? I, 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 nobody wants to see that. No, nobody wants to see that <laughs> happening. I think everybody also understands you know, the politics of, of Scotland, uh, the respect that's 
the UK government has demonstrated for the Scottish government, Scottish Parliament, that, that they would not engage in, in a, that, that sort of a, um, subversive a, uh, d d delay, um, I, because it would simply, you know, n not be not not be feasible in terms of, in terms of, of, of the political reality. It would be, uh, I'm sure you and others uh, would be very, you know, would be very much making that that point. But we've, you know, what, what I think what I think is good and important is in terms of the relationship with. A, uh, the DWP officials, Scottish government officials, it's understanding what some of the, you know, the systems behind the, the, the computer systems, the process systems, what are realistic time scales uh, for making uh, changes. But there would be no intention to, uh, to, to veto proposals brought forward uh, by the Scottish uh, government, either a, either a up front or in some uh, behind the scenes way. So it would have been better if the uh, language in the draft clauses uh, had been uh, put in a different way rather than the way that it has been? The draft clauses are out for a discussion and consideration. There's an opportunity for the committee, for individuals within the Parliament, for the Scottish Government, and we're in a very close dialogue with John Swinney, who is leading, obviously, for the Scottish Government on these matters in relation to the clauses. So if, there are, if there's particular feedback in relation to the clauses, uh, then that can, that can be given. But you uh, can categorically say that also the implication in the language in the clauses is of veto, that there is no veto. Well, I wouldn't have taken that implication a, uh, that, a, 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 of veto. I take, the, I take the clear position of working together, but there is no veto. Thank you. Thank you. Convener. Calvin wants to come in with a short supplementary on that point. Thank you very much, Convener. Um, the Smith Commission devolved a number of disability benefits, but the command paper makes it clear that the UK government still plans to roll out PIP in Scotland. Obviously, PIP has been uh, criticised by a great deal of the disability groups who contributed to the Smith Commission consultation. Um, don't you think that that decision um, tends to contradict the desire to prepare for devolution in good faith? No, I don't think it does. The PIP is on the agenda of uh, the meeting uh, next week with, of, of the joint uh, ministerial uh, group. And again, at that meeting, we'll be looking to understand what it is that the, that the Scottish um, Government want uh, PIP uh, transitioned to. Uh, that's a very important part of, of, of the preparations in relation to this uh, process. And we've made it clear we will work, um, work with them uh, in that regard. But it's, it's not as simple as just switch, you know, of just switching it off. There are no new uh, disability living allowance claimants. There are some people c clearly currently on disability living allowance. Some of those people are receiving less than they should because they haven't had a recent assessment. Some people are maybe receiving more because they haven't had a recent assessment. The, the process can't simply stop, but as soon as we know what it is that the Scottish Government want to transition to in relation to PIP, which not, ev not I mean, uh, oh, there are some critics, but there are some uh, groups who are also supportive of it, um, then that's, that's how we can work with the Scottish Government to, you know, to deliver uh, their aspirations. And as I say, as Richard said earlier in his comments, you know, we've had very good discussions with Scottish Government officials uh, about the mechanics currently uh, of a PIP. But when we know what it is that the Scottish Government want to transition to, that will put us all in a better position to make that transition happen as effectively as possible. Um, Deputy Convener, um, bring you in here. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Minister. Morning. Apologies for um, my sore throat and weak voice this morning. Um, of course, we welcome um, the devolution of the powers within the Smith Commission, but what was also anticipated it would be delivered in spirit as well. Um, on publication, um, Baroness Goldie welcomed um, a list of areas of welfare in this area, including top up the ability to top up existing benefits and to create new ones. 
However, the command paper says that the Scottish Government will not have the power to create permanent entitlement to any new payments beyond the scope of the devolved benefits described earlier. Why has that, what was described as an exciting choice, been removed from the Scottish Government? We're in a, a process of, of discussing uh, the clauses and uh, whether they reflect the, the, uh, uh, both the spirit and the uh, word of the uh, Smith Commission. So, I mean, if, uh, for example, we, we could, there are examples of benefits that you see falling within that uh, area, then we're quite happy, I'm quite happy to take that away and look at that in, as part of this, a, a, as part of, of this, this process. So would you suggest then that maybe there would be an amendment to that clause to, to open up that choice to the Scottish Government? Um, because at this point we might not anticipate a benefit that will be required in the future. Well, I, I think it would be helpful for the, for the debate and discussion in this area you know, if we had some, if we did have some substantive suggestions of, a, of, of benefits that might be, that might be taken forward, so that a, there could be maybe a, a better understanding of, of what, you know, what was sought, and a, uh, whether that, you know, whether amendment of, of the clauses are set out is appropriate. Okay, uh, Annabelle. Good morning, Mr. Mandel. Good morning. The impression I get of the Joint Ministerial Working Group, both from the Cabinet Secretary, Mr Neil, and from yourself, is that there's, I'm happy to say, kind of positive vibes coming out about this. And given the scope of what is transferred um, as proposed by the Smith Commission and um, in consequence of the draft clauses, I'm quite interested in what you see the character of the Joint um, ministerial working group being? I mean, obviously it's got an immediate and very important job, which is how do you how do you deliver this transfer of power as anticipated by the draft clauses? But it seems to me there may be a, a future job for it in terms of the need for both the Scottish Government and the UK Government of whatever hue or complexion to continue to speak to one another because, of course, universal credit, a core benefit, remains reserved. Um, something like the state pension remains reserved and the Scottish Government might have mind to you know, do something supplementary um, in Scotland that doesn't apply to the rest of the UK. Do you see the, the joint ministerial working group perhaps becoming almost a quasi-standing committee just to help this continuing dialogue between the two governments? I think that dialogue is very important. As, as I said to Mr Neil, I mean, I can't speak for any future a, um, government post the election, but I mean, I, I am a, I'm committed to that, that, that process as, it, you know, as, as is the current um, coalition parties. Um, I, I think it's a very, very helpful opportunity to um, air issues, to look at things which may not have been uh, anticipated, a, uh, to a, take forward a, um, the, the transitional a, arrangements and, and be an ability just to, to speak a, uh, directly and openly. And, you know, without disrespect to my um, colleagues present, the DWP is an enormous department necessarily with, you know, doing a large number of complex things. And I think it is very important that we just have, you know, a, you know, a very direct line of communication. If there is an issue that has arisen for uh, Scottish ministers, they can speak directly uh, to me or my counterparts on that group, and we can try, uh, uh, you know, and, and take... A, uh, things uh, forward because everything that happens isn't conspiracy. You know, we do. A, uh, you know, sometimes honest mistakes are made or things are not a, uh, considered in the widest context. It's, so I think it is. A, it's very important that we have that conduit. I think that it will continue. And I think one of the things that we did agree at the first meeting was obviously that, that what is of prime importance are benefit recipients. And we've, you know, the, some other powers which have been transferred to uh, Scottish Parliament, Scottish Government, for example, stamp duty. If the Scottish Government hadn't set up uh, a system to collect stamp duty, well, effectively, they're the losers out of that. 
if you, if you don't set up a system that allows the person to be paid their benefit, then you are actually prejudicing a, a, a vulnerable individual. So it, 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 it is a different sort of transition. We've got to be clear that new systems are in place uh, uh, as, as we make those transitions. But it's a very, I, I, I expect it to be a very effective way of dealing with these, um, dealing with these issues. Another wee question, oh, yeah, thanks, convener. Um, Claire Adamson was investigating the um, clauses in relation to new powers. And I think there is an area for exploration here, if I may say so, um, Minister. I mean, we understand that if a benefit is devolved, um, then the Scottish Government will have the flexibility perhaps to create a new benefit or um, top up. But I'm just wondering how that works in practice because if you take existing devolved areas of responsibility, let's take justice for example or um, education I mean if somebody is coming out of prison now justice is devolved, if someone's coming out of prison um, and maybe they secure a part time job and the Scottish Government thinks it wants to try and help that individual um, to pursue training or whatever it may be um, is, is that something which is competent to the Scottish Government under existing powers? Or would any attempt to do that be ultra vires of the draft clauses? I think that there is a debate all, always potentially around what is a payment and what falls within the social security, a payment within a, a devolved area and what pay, falls within the social security system a, uh, as a reserved. But you know, the point uh, that, that I made in response to Ms. Adamson's uh, uh, issue, uh, issues that she raised it, it is, uh, I think, by setting out examples like that, I think that gives it, 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 clarity if that was what the Smith Commission were looking uh, to achieve a, uh, a, and for us to go back and look and see whether that is reflected within, within the clauses as, as they stand. Just to expand a little on that, convener, if I may, in the example I gave, Minister, could achieve a similar scenario with somebody perhaps who, um, a young person going into work for the first time, um, who may not be in benefit, but may have an identified need for further help with training or access to training. Now, again... Um, I'm not clear if the Scottish Government would have power to help someone like that or set up a scheme to help someone like that. We can set up bursaries, for example, mm -hmm. you know, for, for students. But I think there is a legitimate debate to be had about um, what exactly does the Scottish Government have in terms of responsibility and power <laughs> under its existing devolved settlement. And there maybe needs to be some clarification of that. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm certainly willing to take that, take that back. And I think... If the committee or, or you indeed individually wanted to you know, make that uh, um, contribution to the discussion of the clauses, I think that would be very welcome. Okay, thank you. Okay. I don't know if anyone else is suggesting. Christina, do you want to? I'll pick convener if that's... It's up to you. Yep, it's it's yep, your yep. opportunity to ask questions. Good, good morning, Minister. Um, um, thanks for coming along to the committee. Um, I think my colleagues here will agree with me and possibly yourself that a, a number of the cases coming into our um, mailbag over the past few months have been on benefit sanctions and the impact of benefit sanctions. Do you want to go on to the, the subject of sanctions? Because we, well, we, we, I said it. No, I thought you meant, uh, did you, do you want to go on to something else in relation to uh, the Smith Commission? We're still focusing on Smith. Right, okay. But, well, the, the Minister will make a separate... A set of comments about sanctions and food banks when we come to that point. I'll wait, I'll wait for them then. OK. Uh, Margaret, you wanted to ask something on Smith? Um, yes, and I apologise for my lateness. Unfortunately, I can't apologise for Scott Real, but anyway. Um, just on, uh, you know, around the job, the work programme. Yeah. As mandatory work activity, work experience and work trials are less, if they're less than a year, these will not be devolved. So the addition of reference to Section 17B of the Job Seekers Act 1995 needs to be clarified around that because the command paper says 
conditionality and sanctions will remain reserved, including the ability to make mandatory referrals to the Scottish Government programmes. And the Scottish Government may also choose to offer support to those who are eligible to take part in any scheme of their own making. I just wonder, could you perhaps clarify exactly what that means? Well, I, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to take away a, um, the, spe the specific a, uh, uh, point in relation to, to, to the exact section, but I mean, it was the, the intention was that the, the con conditionality um, and sanctions would remain at a UK uh, level, so that there was a, um, a fairness across. A, a, across the UK in terms of a, a, a recipient of universal credit that they would be that they would be applicable to the same conditions wherever they were within the within the UK so will you come back to I mean I'll come back on, on the specific section you meant but but that's the wider you know that that that's the wider point in relation to a conditionality and a sanctions but I'll come back on that specific section okay I have nothing further to add to that. Um, can I uh, ask a sort of follow-up question, Minister? I think I've, I've been uh, happy to hear that, that you are willing to continue discussing uh, the scope of some aspects of, of the, the command paper. But I think for clarification, it would be good to know, is there anything that you would not be prepared to discuss? Is there anything that you would say absolutely not ever is this going to be on the table in our discussions? We've... we've reached a agreement, the five political parties that took part reached agreement on uh, proposals within the Smith uh, Commission process and that, you know, that, that was the agreement to every, which everybody uh, signed up to. The government's position is, is to implement that. Of course we're open to a discussion on whether the clauses reflect the Commission both in terms of a uh, word and and spirit, so th that that that's absolutely uh, open for discussion. I I'm not a, a, a you know w wanting, however, to get into uh, a discussion about matters which are not within a you know within the Smith Commission. Those are those are issues you know for the UK general election, which will be uh, in about 90 days. Uh, time, if there are those coming forward with proposals which are, uh, you know, other than set out in the Smith Commission, you know, that that will be the forum for the debate. We'll have a general election, and then we'll move forward with whatever the uh, will of the Scottish people in that uh, election and, and their counterparts across the rest of the UK. Okay, uh, Kevin, and I'll come back to Margaret. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, you said that in terms of the five political parties. Um, that uh, they were listened to in terms of Smith. How about Civic Scotland themselves and uh, the third sector in particular, um, who you know have got particular concerns round about the rollout of personal independence payments, um, as my colleague Joe McAlpine said. Will you listen to them uh, in terms of uh, changing uh, these draft clauses to, to bring about legislation uh, that not only um, the Scottish Parliament uh, may want to see uh, in the hands uh, of, of, of this body, but that Civic Scotland wants to see in the hand of this body rather than that of uh, the Westminster Parliament? We, want, we very much want to engage with, with, with Civic Scotland, and I welcome the establishment of the of, of a, uh, the leaders uh, group, and we're in discussions with uh, Margaret Lynch uh, about that and how that group uh, could uh, um, interact with 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 the joint uh, ministerial uh, group. There has been extensive uh, in, in engagement with uh, stakeholders to date. Obviously, as part of the Smith process, a very ambitious timetable uh, was set, uh, but uh, all those who, who wanted to make a contribution uh, got, got to do so. 
uh, to, uh, and now it's about taking forward what is, you know, what, what is set out in, in the Commission report. But uh, yes, I do give a commitment to to engage a, uh, with Civic Scotland. As I say, I think the leaders' group is a very good step uh, forward. What I can't give an undertaking clearly to do, you know, is, is to be in agreement with every as every element of Civic Scotland. Clearly, there are some matters on which we, you know, we won't be in agreement with. Um, I, I understand there are always going to be things that folks disagree on. That's the way of the world. Uh, but what we have seen, uh, even in the areas which are to be developed. Involved, for example, like the work programme where, you know, the third sector um, have got some very clear views on what they would like to see there. We, we have seen our inability, even when it is devolved, our inability to shape that because the contract has already been uh, awarded for the next number of years. Um, in terms of personal independence payments, uh, as, uh, as Joan McAlpine pointed out, um, you say that the rollout will continue, even so we can shape something different here, which is, uh, um, which I think could be better um, for folks here in Scotland. So, in terms of this continued uh, rollout of various programmes as uh, are set at this moment in time by the coalition government in Westminster, do you not think it would be wise to put a halt to some of these things to allow the devolution of these powers so that we can shape these things ourselves uh, to ensure that they are best uh, for the people of Scotland? I want you to be able to shape these things uh, for the people of Scotland, but I'd like to see what the sh that shape is. I mean, it, you know, I, I, we've, we've, got, you're... we've got, in, in order to transition from where we are now to where you want to go, and I respect that under the new, under the new arrangements, that will be uh, your decision. And I, I very, very much welcome uh, hearing you say that, that, the, that you want to see much more local devolution within Scotland, because I think in relation to a number of these programmes, that's, you know, that's a very, very important element, that, we're de that things are delivered in a bespoke way to meet the particular needs of particular parts of Scotland. But it is, it, it is about setting out what that what that shape is of what you want to transition to, to allow that process of transition to take place. It's not a case of just simply switching it off today uh, w w without there being anything uh, to replace it. But are you denying us the opportunity to shape some of these services at an early stage by entering uh, into contracts now, which uh, we will have to adhere to? And the best example of that is the work programme, where you've recently um, signed a contract, which, in, in all honesty, would have been quite easy for you um, to say, right, we'll, we'll sign that contract um, for England and Wales, uh, but we'll caveat it for Scotland because the Scottish Parliament, when this uh, matter is devolved may choose to take a different direction from the one that we're doing. Indeed, it, it may, and that's what we're going to be discussing at the Joint Ministerial Working Group uh, next... But the contract uh, has been signed, ne Minister. Ne next week. What we're saying is, let's see what it is you <coughs> want to transition to and we'll work with you to try and achieve that. But, but you have already signed a contract in the work programme for a number of years, which really uh, puts us into a corner in terms of trying to deal with that when it's devolved. That, that, Why was that, 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 that's, that wouldn't be my interpretation of that, Mr Stewart. Let's see the Scottish Government bring forward proposals for what they want to do in relation to the work programme. Indeed, uh, you know, Mr Murphy has indicated he has some proposals. Let's see what those proposals are and let's see how we can best, uh, best transition to them. And so that's what we're going to be working to in our joint uh, uh, ministerial a working group and you know I've said in my earlier remarks our approach to this is very much not you can't do this you can't do that it is what is it do you want to do and how can we best achieve a transition to that so you're saying that in terms of that contract which has been signed by the UK government there is some caveat in that contract which will allow uh, us when that uh, power is transferred to get out of that contract without penalty? I'm saying bring forward the proposals that you want in relation to the work programme in Scotland and we will work to try and achieve that. Um, I, I notice that you're not answering the question uh, because I think that uh, what we uh, have at this moment 
uh, is something that the UK government has signed up to, which would be very difficult for us to get out of, no matter how we want to shape the programme. Would I be right in thinking that? Uh, well, from the, the, the range of questions that you've asked me today and previously, you know, that, that's always a sort of mindset that you appear to adopt in these uh, discussions. I've adopted a positive mindset. We want the Scottish Government to be able to set uh, what, out what, and shape, as you say, their own work programme. We want to do everything that we can to allow that uh, to happen. But the key and fundamental part of that is the Scottish Government coming forward with what their proposals for the work programme is and then uh, how, that, how we can transition to that. Within the contract that you've already signed? I'm not getting into a discussion about government contracts you know, in, in, in public. What I'm saying, and I, couldn't, I don't think I could be clearer in respect of what I'm saying, is we want to understand what it is that you uh, um, uh, want to achieve and how we can best work towards uh, making uh, that uh, happen. And I don't see that in terms of always identifying every obstacle that might possibly uh, be pulled out of uh, the air. It's about looking at the possibilities. But the absolute fundamental is what is, what is the shape of the new work programme in Scotland and therefore how can we move from where we are now to that. But in the meantime, when there isn't something on the table the existing work programme will continue. Would it not be easier to have a moratorium in the signing of contracts such as this until these powers are devolved so that we can shape these services ourselves? We're using the Joint Ministerial Working Group as a basis uh, to discuss what does happen uh, in the interim. But I look forward to seeing the Scottish Government proposals and working to achieve uh, their implementation as we have in relation to a whole uh, range of, of other issues, not least discretionary housing payment, which I uh, spoke about earlier. Thank you, Camilla. Okay, thanks, Ben. And Margaret, I think we'll just wrap up this section after Margaret asks a okay. question. Thank you, and I will be brief. And it's around uh, expenditure and how that's going to be uh, adjusted. So for public services in year one, there will be a block grant adjustment for everything in DEL and in subsequent years Scotland would receive a population share of any change in spending um, at UK level for example through the Barnet formula and I just wonder um, you know what a uh, difference you see in the Barnet formula um, for that and also on the, the welfare in year one there will be a block grant adjustment and then the UK and Scottish Government will have to work together to agree how this adjustment would be indexed in the future. I, and, you know, just even the conversations around this uh, table this morning, I mean, I'm sure that won't be easy. And I just, my concern is around the time that that could take to come up with this new index. And also, you know, the my real concern is for the people who are dependent on welfare benefits and what that will mean to them. And perhaps you could maybe um, expand on that. As an overall point, we're in agreement with the Scottish Government that, that as we move forward with this whole process, the, the absolute uh, objective is not is that there should be no de detriment to uh, individual claimants during the pr during the process of, of, of transition, and we, and we will set that as a, a you know, as an ab absolute. Obviously, the Barnet formula is a, uh, a to continue on on the basis of of the uh, commitments certainly of uh, the Prime Minister, leader of the opposition, and leader uh, of a. Um, the, the Liberal Democrats, so we will continue to operate with the Barnet formula. Obviously, the Barnet formula, do, which then delivers a block grant, th that block grant will be adjusted in, in terms of uh, the income raised uh, by uh, the tax powers being devolved to the Scottish Parliament. There's to be a financial framework which is to sit alongside uh, the new uh, Scotland Act and that's a uh, subject now of discussions between uh, John Swinney uh, and 
uh, the Chancellor and Chief Secretary uh, to uh, the Treasury, and at some point, as the legislation uh, is going through, uh, begins to go through the parliamentary process, that framework will be sent, set out. But again, it will be very much something that has been agreed between, uh, between the, the uh, respective uh, governments. Is there a time scale for that? The, 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 there's a time, well, the, the time scale would be uh, within the next few, few months. I mean, obviously, you know, we do have the, the UK general election. The government, Whitehall will go into Purda on a, the, the, at midnight on the 30th of a, uh, Mar uh, March. And I think there's some, there's just some Purda that reflects into the Scottish government. I, we'll have a general election. A, uh, the outcome of that uh, will then determine who's the government, and you know, the, the, I mean, the, in, there will be a degree of hiatus. But a, um, I, I would anticipate that, that, that it will be done relatively shortly, because it will it will it will require to be mm. to meet the timescale of the bill going through Parliament. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Joan, one short supplementary before we move on. Well, actually, convener, um, I've had a short supplementary, but I haven't had a question well, session. <laughs> Thank you very then. much. Um, yes, uh, Mr Mundell, you, you mentioned Margaret Lynch, Lynch, the Chief Executive of Citizens Advice Scotland, earlier, and um, how you wanted to reach agreement with the leaders group. Um, Ms Lynch has been very, very clear that she was deeply disappointed uh, that the migration from disability living allowance to personal independence payments would continue. Now, I know we have touched on, on this earlier, but if you are so keen to reach agreement with groups like Citizens Advice Scotland, why will you not consider halting the migration? I, I, think, I think I said in my answer to, to Mr uh, Stewart that we wanted to engage with uh, um, groups uh, throughout Scotland, but that didn't necessarily mean that ultimately we would reach agreement uh, with them. I, I, I think uh, Margaret Lynch and Citizens Advice Scotland have some, have some very interesting uh, uh, things to say, particularly uh, about shaping a, a, a new a, uh, benefits a, uh, system in Scotland. But the fundamental uh, point remains that we need to understand what it is that the Scottish Government want to move to to allow us uh, to, to, to achieve the most effective uh, transition in, in relation to, to personal independence uh, payments. And I don't think that it would be right uh, that existing uh, recipients of DLA who are receiving too little don't get a reassessment or that people who perhaps are receiving too much don't get a reassessment because some people have not had an assessment for a very long time. There are no new DLA recipients. There haven't been uh, for well over uh, a year. So everybody new to the system has gone into uh, personal uh, independence payments. But the quicker that we can understand what the Scottish Government want to transition to, the quicker we can achieve a transition. But we can't just switch off uh, midpoint. We've got to understand what it is we're transitioning, uh, what we're transitioning to. Is it not the case that the, the rollout, the continued migration will save 20% from the bill. Is that not the real reason why you're not continuing, uh, why, why you are continuing with the migration uh, to save money? It, it, it's it's t not t uh, simply to save money, it's to uh, achieve a practical objective of, of transitioning to what the Scottish Government want as a, an alternative. And this, this is the opportunity uh, for for the Scottish Government to come forward with w whatever uh, the alternatives uh, might be. And that's uh, going to be on the agenda next week at our uh, uh, joint working ministerial uh, working uh, group. And the undertaking that I gave in relation to the work programme is the same as in relation to personal independence payments. Tell us what you want to do and we'll work to achieve that as expeditiously as we possibly can. So if that was the case, you, we, would, we would inherit the budget that we have at the moment. We wouldn't get that 20% cut if you could reach agreement at that meeting. We've uh, the, the Smith Commission uh, proceeded on the basis of a, um, the funding proposals that were in place uh, at the time 
of a of the a uh, Smith a commission. That that's what happened. The Scottish government is working uh, on. I, I would imagine, and as we see the financial framework develop, uh, th they would have a clear understanding of what uh, funding would be uh, available to them. But the First Minister hasn't made, has made it very clear that she, um, she wants that, uh, she doesn't want that 20% cut. Can you give us a reassurance that we're not going to get that 20% cut in these benefits? What I'm, what I'm saying is we want to transition to what the Scottish Government uh, want uh, to achieve as expeditiously uh, as we can. I think that should be uh, the focus uh, of... So of, a 20% cut, well, cut or no 20% cut? Oh, uh, well, you see, I think, you're just, I think that is characterising in the debate in the way uh, uh, that, that wants to try and, and portray bad faith on behalf of... Uh, of the UK government. That doesn't exist. The Scottish Government is well aware of the funding projections in relation to uh, these benefits and what it has available to work with. So rather than uh, trying to get drawn into that sort of emotive language, the best use of time and resource would be to come forward with what your alternative is. That's what we need. And at this moment, we don't have that. Thanks very much, Minister. I think that's has exhausted that uh, element of our discussion this morning. Uh, do you want to have a couple of minutes to have a break, or would you prefer just to move on to your next comments? I wouldn't mind another cup of coffee if that was well, uh, in that possible. Case, I'll suspend the meeting for a few minutes to allow people just to uh, re refresh themselves before the next session.
Okay, I'll open up the meeting by inviting the Minister to give us some opening comments to take us into the second part of our discussion this morning. Again, over to you, Minister. Um, thank you, Convener. As, as I think we said earlier, when I last appeared at uh, the committee, I undertook to engage with organisations who had given evidence to uh, your committee in respect to food bank uh, usage. One clear message uh, which came out of all um, the discussions uh, that I had with uh, food bank providers and other uh, organisations involved in this field was uh, a wish to see an end to politicking uh, on this issue and a wish to see reasoned uh, debate, to see cross-party, cross-border, cross-government uh, approaches to tackle uh, the issues that are leading uh, people to use uh, food banks. And I, I certainly agree uh, with that approach, and I think I set that uh, out when I last uh, saw you. My view um, hasn't changed from the previous session. I believe the reasons for the use of food banks are both varied and complex. I also uh, review, remain of the view that the most effective uh, anti-poverty measure is, is a successful uh, economy, and uh, that is a sentiment which your uh, colleague Jackie Bailey expressed recently. That said, I want to touch on three areas which are most often uh, discussed uh, around uh, this subject, sanctions, delays in benefit, and low incomes, none of which I would uh, describe as, as welfare reform, although that is uh, clearly the topic that is uh, sometimes <clears throat> banded around with those uh, who have uh, particular agendas. Sanctions aren't new. They were brought forward by uh, the last Labour government, and of course Labour didn't oppose the changes this coalition government made. At my last appearance, SNP members confirmed that they too supported conditionality on uh, job seekers' uh, benefit and that there should be some requirement to produce evidence that work was being uh, sought. And that was uh, also set out in the Scottish Government's uh, own uh, Welfare Commission report that there had to be uh, hard uh, edges. We need clearly to ensure that we have a fair and reasonable system in place which is understood by complain com claimants and consistently applied by DWP staff. Obviously, sanctions have been the subject of the Oakley Review, and that is currently the subject of a Department of Work and Pensions Committee uh, inquiry in Westminster. And I am sure that Dame Anne Begg, who chairs that committee, would, uh, very, would welcome a submission from this committee if you chose uh, t to make one. At my previous experience, I stated, that, I stated that there were no targets for sanctions, and indeed, my, in my experience, job centre staff have no wish to sanction individuals. They want to help uh, people into work. And one thing I do want to say and put on the record is that job centre staff are often much maligned and, and identified uh, with, with, with sanctions, when in fact they are people who are trying to help people uh, into uh, work, and they, uh, they shouldn't be uh, the focus of any of these uh, uh, comments. I also asked the committee, as I did all those who gave uh, evidence that I met, and uh, every council in Scotland to pass on details of people who had been unjustly sanctioned. I'm not saying that there aren't such people, but we've not received many uh, examples. Of course, there's a review and appeal process in place, but any case you or any other elected representative have of someone being unjustly sanctioned, uh, I will undertake uh, to have that investigated because that is not what uh, we are looking to achieve. One issue, though, I do take on board is uh, in relation to housing benefit and sanctions and the misperception that uh, when someone is sanctioned, they lose housing benefit. This is not the case. Housing benefit is passported to job seekers 
uh, allowance, and therefore when the job seeker's allowance stops, the housing benefit uh, stops. But by contacting the local authority and advising of a change of circumstances, housing benefit in most cases should continue. Now, it's quite clear that there is a lack of awareness of this, uh, and we need to do more to ensure that those people uh, who are subject uh, to sanctions understand that and that the flow of information between the DWP and local authorities uh, in that regard is uh, also uh, improved. We take on board what was raised in, 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 in the Oakley uh, report in relation to making it clear uh, that there is a availability of uh, short-term uh, benefit uh, advance and DWP staff have been further uh, briefed in relation uh, to that to make sure that, uh, that it's understood that that's available along with uh, hardship payments for those people who are in the most uh, difficult uh, circumstances. But I would welcome a decision with the committee as to where they see the balance in relation to uh, conditionality uh, applying. If there is agreement that there should be conditionality, we have to, we have to understand how the balance uh, is, is struck. And your uh, views in that regard, I would be interested to hear. On delays in benefit, 93% of benefits have been processed in 60, 16 days sorry, uh, in relation to, to job seekers allowance and employment support allowance. And that is a 7% improvement on uh, 2010. Benefits have always been paid in arrears and there hasn't been any significant proposal that I'm aware of to uh, change uh, that. But again, uh, the use of the uh, short-term benefit advance or, pay or hardship payments uh, uh, can have a, uh, an, an impact on that uh, process, which of course is a two-way process uh, with uh, the applicant. I was struck in my meeting with the BMA, for example, on, on the concept of trying to bring together benefit support with uh, NHS provision in relation to those uh, with mental health issues. And I think that there was some, uh, that there's some really uh, uh, good work out there, uh, which I think uh, could certainly in that, uh, uh, that area lead to an improvement. And finally, in relation to a, uh, the um, issue of uh, low income, I think everyone uh, round the table uh, is, is signed up in support uh, of the living wage. I think we need to do more uh, to encourage it. I was very heartened uh, when I spoke to South Lanarkshire Council about an initiative uh, they are uh, pursuing to bring employers together to then try and spread the word to other employers uh, of the benefit uh, of uh, paying the living wage. And of course my colleague here in the Scottish Parliament, Ruth Davidson, has called upon uh, the Scottish Government to incentivise the paying of the living wage through the small business uh, bonus, which is uh, similar to a scheme which operates in some parts uh, or some boroughs in London and which is proving to be a, uh, successful. And of course, more widely, the government has sought to raise the uh, personal uh, allowance to take as many uh, people out of a uh, tax uh, as possible. So those are my, uh, th th those are my thoughts uh, following a, uh, those discussions. I, I want to thank everyone uh, who met with me. I, I listed them in my uh, letter uh, to you. I found you know, the discussions frank and useful, but I do come back to the point that I made at the start of my remarks that a, uh, all of the organisations I spoke to found a, the, the politicking of this issue was getting in the way of trying to resolve it. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Minister. Just a couple of points to start with in, in relation to your comments. Um, Dayman Begg's um, committee work, uh, we have already made a submission to that. We sent a report and we have invited Anne Begg to actually come to us and uh, meet with us 
here uh, in committee. So we are having a, an ongoing dialogue uh, with her and her committee uh, in relation to that, that ongoing work. Um, <clears throat> you also commented on the discussions you'd had with organisations following our last meeting. And the, I think you, you indicated you, you felt there had been a lack of um, examples uh, given to you, although we had discussed uh, that being uh, something we wanted to pursue with you. Uh, again, just to, to clarify, uh, the clerks of our committee and, and your own officials have been in dialogue since that period, and we have uh, a, a number of uh, examples to send you, and, and they'll be on their way. We just haven't managed to uh, get the, the communications uh, between our, ourselves and, and your officials uh, in, in order. I think we've been disappointed that we haven't quite um, going forward in the, the constructive manner that I think we've left our discussions the last time you were before us, but we won't uh, dwell on that. We'll just uh, engage positively and, and you'll be in receipt of those um, collated uh, responses in, in due course. Um, and I would personally uh, agree with you about taking um, the, the politics out. Uh, I hear that clear message as well uh, when I talk to, to organisations, churches, third sector bodies, charities, who are all engaged in this area. And, and they have one clear message. You're absolutely right. They don't want politicking uh, involved in this discussion. So while there may well be varied and complex explanations as to why we've had such an exponential increase in the use of food banks, to take the politics out of it, will you join the consensus? Will your government concede, finally, that there is a causal link between your sanctions regime and the welfare reforms that you've introduced, which has increased the use of food banks. If you agree that, then we're all on the same page because all of the evidence we have suggests that there is that causal link. The only people who will not recognise that, the only politicians who will not concede that, are you and your government. What I'm asking you this morning, convener, to come forward with is, is what your views are in relation to how a sanctions regime, which you support a, uh, in terms of, 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 of there being sanctions, as I understand the Scottish Government supports conditionality, to come forward with, with views and suggestions as to how and why that, a, uh, why that regime isn't a... Uh, a, a, a as you would, as you would want it uh, to be. Okay, I'll come uh, you back. Know, the, the, uh, you I, know, I will uh, answer you absolutely uh -huh. correctly, uh, Minister, because it was in our report. It was a conclusion to our report that sanctions should be a last resort. Uh -huh. Pure and simple. People should not find out that they have been sanctioned for something they know nothing about on the day that they expect to receive their benefits and they don't arrive. Mm -hmm. We have examples of that. I could give you personal examples of that. The reality of the situation is that people are sanctioned and then discover that they've been sanctioned. They haven't been spoken to. They haven't been worked with. They haven't been given an opportunity to explain their situation. They discover that they are sanctioned because of a decision of the Department of Work and Pensions as a first action. As a first action, not a last resort. So can we get agreement that a sanctions regime conditionality can only occur at the end of a process in which the recipient of the benefit has continually shown evidence of refusal to work within that system, not as a first action. Let's get all, all those uh, examples on, onto the table then. I mean, that, that, that's... That, that's the approach that I, I, I want uh, to pursue because it, it, there's no point in me simply saying that that doesn't happen. If you have examples that it has happened, it shouldn't happen uh, that way. When I speak to DWP job centre uh, uh, advisors, they're not, uh, they, they're not looking to achieve uh, those, uh, th th that, that outcome. That isn't what it's about. So, let, but if that is happening, then we have to 
uh, you know, we, we have to see the, the, the examples of that, of, of that, of that happening, and, and making sure it doesn't. But Nobody, sure there, sure there is the no, there is no position in relation to the DWP where sanctions is the first a resort. Sure that is not the position. If that has happened, it shouldn't have happened. And, and we, need to do, uh, we need to do something about it. Okay. So surely, if the DWP analyses how it's operating the sanctions regime, they would know and would be able to categorically quantify the work that has been done with a benefits recipient before a sanction was imposed. That would be there. It would be well, within the, the, uh, the statistics and the analysis of the work of the Department of Work and Pensions. We will provide examples. We will give you examples of that. We, uh, everyone sitting around this table will have examples of that. But surely the Department of Work and Pensions will know and will have proof that they have only issued a sanction by being able to verify the work that has been done with a benefits recipient before that sanction was imposed. And you would know that, and the officials of the DWP would know it, and the ministers at the DWP would know it. They would uh, uh, know uh, that, but there is there is a, a process in relation to uh, sanctions, which goes to a uh, the, the, which goes to uh, an independent uh, advisor to, to give a decision. The, 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 there is a, a review process and an appeal process in relation a uh, uh, in relation to those. A, uh, in, in relation to those sanction processes, okay. but you know, I, I, and they, the, 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 that review and appeal uh, does identify where a, um, where the, 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 the sanction was inappropriately a, applied, but the, the, the majority of cases that go through that process are upheld. Exactly. So the question I have for you, Minister. When a decision is made to sanction someone, that decision is made at the outset. There is then an investigation at which an appeal is made and a decision is made, and it can be that that sanction is subsequently uh, not upheld. In the interim period, in the meantime, the recipient does not receive their benefit. They have to prove their innocence. They are guilty until they can prove their innocence. They do not receive their benefit and have to resort to using a food bank in the meantime. Is that not the case? I, I don't accept that analysis, because firstly, it's predicate, it, it, it seems to be predicated on the suggestion that you, almost as soon as they come through the door, uh, they, they would be sanctioned. That is not the case. Sanctions are a last uh, resort. And if, if you, I'm, I'm, I, know you, I know you're shaking your head, but provide us with some details of people who have no employment history with, or, uh, uh, with, with uh, the DWP who are immediately sanctioned. And we will, we will take that away because that should not, with, that, with that should not respect, happen. With all due respect, Minister, we have sent you and your officials our report. That report contains those examples. It, that report contains the evidence of third sector bodies, of churches, of recipients. No. You cannot deny what is in black and white, what is in the evidence of the people that this committee and other organisations have looked at. If we're wrong, then Oxfam are wrong, the churches are wrong, the Trussell Trust is wrong. Why is everyone wrong but your government is right? I'm not uh, saying that everyone else is wrong. I'm asking you quite reasonably to come forward with the specific examples of, of people who've been subject to, this, to the scenario you set out. I don't, think that that, I don't think that's an unreasonable thing to do. The groups, when I've met with Oxfam and the Trussell Trust and these other organisations, they don't think that that's an unreasonable thing uh, to do because we need to investigate what has happened in these individual DWP uh, offices that have allowed those circumstances uh, to, to, to come about. If somebody comes to me as, an, as, a, as a member of parliament with these circumstances, I immediately would take them up with, with the DWP and find out why that had happened and look to make sure in relation to that particular office that that didn't 
that that didn't happen again. Because the scenarios which are, are, are being set out, and I'm not saying that they haven't happened in relation uh, to individuals, but we need to have we need to have information about about the specifics because otherwise it's not possible uh, to uh, you know, to take the ne take the necessary uh, action within the individual offices. It is possible at a high level uh, and in terms of training to set it out. But sanctions are. It is made clear to staff when I've met with DWP staff, as I said in my initial remarks, they are not there waiting to sanction someone. They're there trying to get someone into work. Now, as the Oakley report has identified, there are sometimes that there has been miscommunication and there have been opportunities identified to improve that. And there certainly has been uh, not, uh, not clear enough uh, information in relation to short-term benefit uh, advance and into uh, hardship uh, payments. And uh, that has been taken on board in relation to the, the Oakley report. I myself, from the discussions uh, that I've had, see clearly that there is an issue in relation to housing benefit. Many people have come to the conclusion that housing benefit is automatically lost if someone is sanctioned. That's not the case, and we should, we should be making sure that that is not happening. OK, I'll ask you one last question before going to the, the committee. Do you accept that there has been a huge increase in the use of food banks? And do you increase, do you agree that there has been an increase in the level of sanctions imposed by the DWP? Well, I think you're inviting me to suggest, inviting me in another way to, uh, 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 you know, g give you a, a response to the question that, that you asked earlier. We're not, um, uh, you know, in, in best of faith, we're not going to, we're just not going to agree uh, uh, on on that. What we are going to agree is that we need to do something about it, and that's best achieved by everyone uh, working uh, together to bring that uh, about, and the, 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 this committee has a contribution uh, to make to that, and I, res I respect uh, the work that you have done, but you wouldn't expect me to agree with everything that you have concluded, I don't uh, suspect. Okay, I'll open up to Christina to follow by Kevin. Very much, convener, and, and thanks for uh, allowing me to come, come back on this. Minister, you, you mentioned a, a lot of talk there about sanctions. Um, do you think sanctions work? This, your own a, uh, welfare commission that the Scottish Government set up ahead of the referendum thinks that there has to be conditionality. So, uh, the, you know, the Labour Party, uh, my party, my coalition colleagues think there has to be conditionality, that you can't simply uh, take no action if people don't look for work when on uh, um, job-seeking benefits. OK. I believe that's at the end of a process, which is... is well, we've, we've, had a dis we've had a discussion yeah, about, about of that. Do you believe sanctions actually encourage people into work? I think you can't have a process of, of people receiving job-seeking uh, benefits without there being some condition on that in relation to them uh, looking for work. But what I do think uh, is the best way uh, out, of a, uh, out of poverty is work and is a, a successful uh, economy. And that is clearly a, um, the objective uh, of a... Uh, the UK government, and even acknowledge that it's the objective of the um, Scottish government. And I, for example, very much welcome myself that there are 1,900 more people in work in my own constituency than there were in 2010. I think that that is something to be very positive about. So it is the objective of achieving a uh, work a, and growing our economy. You know that has to be at, at, uh, has to be uh, the objective. Sanctions are part of of the benefit uh, system, but they're not a uh, they're, they're not a the, the, the relation to a um, work is different from the economic uh, one. 
I'm, gl I'm glad you, you, you drew that distinction. Of the 1,900 people that you said are now in work since 2010 in your constituency, how many of them do you think got into work via the use of sanctions? Well, I think that's... I, I just think that is a false a, um, analysis. I'm not saying that we're sanctioning people into work. What I'm saying uh, is that if you are in receipt of a benefit, which is being funded by taxpayers, often people who are not on that high an income, you should look for work. That's what I'm saying. And that if you don't look for work, there should be some conditionality on that. OK. The Oxford University published research... And I know that you gave an undertaking the last time you were here to do some research on, on the correlation between sanctions and food banks and that. D did you do that research? I've set out, there's been a whole host of, of, of research that has been set out. The government. But is the DWP the, in your department? The, the government. Research? Ha, well, I, I have concluded since I, I last appeared before this committee that any research produced uh, by uh, ourselves would not uh, necessarily. I command a, uh, everybody's a, acceptance and therefore it's very important that we have independent a, uh, evidence that we can all um, subscribe to. So there have been a number of government publications. You, 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 will, have, you, you will have seen them. There's also been uh, the excellent report Feeding uh, Britain, which was, which was, was, was pulled together by an all-party group of a, uh, MPs. So there has been, there has been a, lot of, a, a lot of work uh, done. OK, but no DWP research from what I can find, and I've researched many, mm. many of the publications that you, you've spoken about. The University of Oxford published um, evidence and, mm -hmm. and research a few weeks ago, and they said they were unable to detect any impact on employment recovery. And of 100 people sanctioned, it's probable that 46 sanctions are adverse, and of those, only 3.5 of these were associated with finding work. So do sanctions work? I've set out for you that sanctions are not a, aimed at a, uh, employment. They're aimed at ensuring that people who are in receipt of, uh, of working benefits uh, look for work. Now, I, I think there's a perfectly good, exam, good argument to have, and I'm sure if we want to go into the UK general election and the SNP want to adopt a position that, rega that regardless of whether you look for work or not, you should still receive unemployment no benefits. No one's saying that. That is so I'm that, that, not that's that. a position that you uh, should adopt, <laughs> uh, uh, and, and, and the public uh, can make a, uh, their. Uh, say what okay. I'm making clear is the route to what the route out of poverty and the route to work is a successful economy. That's the government's uh, objective, uh, and uh, that is what uh, we have gone a long way to achieve. Although there is a lot more uh, uh, to do. If you have, and as I invited with the convener, you have specific suggestions as to how the sanctions regime could be improved, how it could be uh, transparent, more consistently applied, very happy to, 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 to hear uh, that. But I, I don't see the purpose of a semantic uh, um, your discussion around whether sanctions get people in, into work. OK, then, let's look at some of the facts and a lot of the research that I've read on this, this subject. Almost a quarter of referrals for sanctions are given to people with disabilities exasperating health conditions. Of those, a number of them are young men between the ages of 18 and 24, which really, if you look at South Lanarkshire's own um, evidence, the, the um, young men facing sanctions and destitution and hardship track the suicide rate. 21% of those sanctions claimants have had their utilities disconnected. The DWP conducts no research on that. So, you know, the, these are facts, and I've got some examples of people who have been mm -hmm. sanctioned. A man with heart problems who was an employment support allowance had a heart attack during a work capability assessment. He was sanctioned for not completing the assessment. Mm 
A man who had gotten a job and was scheduled to be begin in a fortnight was sanctioned because he wouldn't look for a job in the fortnight he was waiting to start his new job. An army veteran, Stephen Taylor, 60 years of age, whose job seeker allowance was stopped after he, he sold poppies in memory of fallen soldiers. These are all just absolutely terrifying examples of how sanctions are utilised and how they have a, then have an impact on human beings. And if you look at some of the work as well that the R RNIB have done, I, I believe that they are actually taking the UK government to task on this, on some of the sanction failures, where they, would, they, they rejected giving people information in Braille, which then put them at risk of being sanctioned. So, Given all of that evidence, an easy tap into Google will find you many of this stuff with good backed up evidence. Why does the DWP not do its own analysis on the impact on people? If you have details of those individuals, then give us give us give us those a uh, give us those give us those details of of the individuals. I'm very the, the I, just giving you the I, examples. I, yeah. Right, we'll we'll take it down. We'll get we'll get the person's address and national insurance number after the meeting. We'll take them away and find out what happened. If anybody had come to me as a member of parliament that had been sanctioned for selling poppies, I would have made very sure that I would have had something <coughs> absolutely done about it there and then. That particular that story is was not, the front page of a national that is, that it, Yes, but you have to provi provide us with the details. We'll have a look at them and see why some of the, those things have happened, which, which seem, uh, on the face of it, out of kilter with what uh, the objective uh, should be. But I don't know that you're saying, or maybe you are saying, that no young men between 16 and 24 should be sanctioned. There, is a, there, there are difficulties with working with a, uh, that a, age group to ensure that we give them the best support we possibly can to get them into work, because that is the objective. But I'm not clear from what you're saying that you, your, your view is that regardless of whatever, whatever approach they took in relation to uh, their benefit payment, sh there should be no conditions. <clears throat> appeals. You mm -hmm. mentioned there's appeal procedure. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us where the UK government sits right now in the DWP on the proposal in a secret paper released last year that suggested that people would be charged to appeal? DWP has no plans to charge people for appeal. Um, I'm not familiar with that secret paper, but um, we've no plans. To introduce okay, that. Okay, I'll send you the information on that then. It's very easy to find. There's a That's number we, of people, we, we human no rights lawyers, taking a position on it as well. I'll send you that inf in, 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 uh, information. Just a final point. Are you aware, Minister, of a PCS survey that was done among staff working in DWP that suggested that 61% of them said they had been pressured into referring claimants for sanctions when they believed it was inappropriate to do so? Well, that's not my experience of speaking to DWP staff across Scotland, and I've spoken, I, I've spoken to... So the PCS uh, survey wrong, then? It, that, that's a very easy uh, question in the context of what I, what I said at the start of politicking. Oh, let's, let, let's just corral everybody. Somebody's right, somebody's wrong. These are complicated issues which are not... You know, which are just not dealt very with by, human by sound bites. Exactly. Human beings this. are not dealt with by sound bites. And that is the problem uh, with the approach that some people have to this issue that a number of sound bites, getting headlines in the papers, that's uh, the objective. Not actually dealing with the underlying issue, which is moving people out of poverty and moving people into work. That's what I'm trying to achieve. That's what our government is trying to achieve. I want to work with you and anybody else to do that. Okay, we'll move on to you can only work together if you listen. I, well, I, th I think my track record is one of listening. It doesn't necessarily mean agreeing. It doesn't necessarily uh, mean doing exactly uh, what uh, you want. But I think I, uh, I may be criticised for many things, but listening I don't think is one of them. Okay, I'll move on to Kevin to be followed by Claire. And we need to start watching the clock. Thank you, uh, convener. Um, in evidence uh, to the committee, um, Dr David Webster of the University of Glasgow 
said there is now a deliberate policy to drive up the level of sanctions to previously unheard of levels through managerial pressure on job centre staff. In practice, staff have now have very little scope for discretion and are frequently driven to impose sanctions on any excuse. Uh, Dr Webster is a research fellow of, of urban studies at the University of Glasgow. Um, would you like to comment on uh, what Dr Webster had to say to this committee? The number of um, sanctions has, has stayed roughly the same in, in uh, the last uh, year. In the previous year, it was 78,670, and uh, in the current year, it's 78,709. What was it five so, years ago, Minister? So, well, I'll, I'll get you that. Uh, I'll get you that. Do your officials uh, have that at um, hand? A figure. A, uh, we can uh, produce that, but it would, it, I, I think the context in which you uh, read out that quote would indicate that there was a current pressure to increase the number of people on sanctions. There is not, there is no target for the number of people on sanctions. It is in nobody's interest for people to be put on sanctions. It, 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 it a, uh, is the objective to try and get people into work. But ultimately, we have to decide whether we want to have a system that says if you're receiving a, work, a benefit for look, well, out of work, should there be any conditions on that? Bill Scott of Inclusion Scotland uh, said in evidence uh, about sanctions uh, and targets. There, therefore, there is a bit of sophistry within DWP when it says that no targets exist, no league tables exist, and so on. In fact, that is what is happening in practice. I have messages on my mobile phone uh, from public and commercial services union members who have been taken into disciplinary meetings to be told that they are being disciplined because they have not imposed enough sanctions. Other PCS members have been told that they will not be getting their annual uplift in pay, their increment, because they have not sanctioned sufficient people in the last year. Would you like to comment on that, Minister? I don't recognise that statement. You don't recognise that statement? No, but if you, again, bring forward individuals... It, no, not, 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 not generic. Individuals for whom that's happened, I'm very happy to meet them on a confidential a, uh, basis and ensure that there was no detriment uh, to them. If, uh, but I am not familiar. I've visited most of the a, uh, job uh, centres within, a, certainly within central Scotland. I've spoken to staff in a very open and frank a, way, and nobody conveys back uh, that message. Now, I know you, you will probably conclude that's because uh, uh, they're, they're concerned about management or, or, or otherwise. But if there are people uh, who uh, have that experience, then I want to hear from them. Uh, Minister, all of the information that I've just read out is contained in the report that this committee uh, put a great deal of work into <coughs> earlier on this year, which was actually sent to you and to your officials uh, and also to others. Um, what I would ask you um, is that in terms of the evidence that we have received um, from the likes of, uh, of Mr Scott uh, and from uh, Dr Webster, will you carry out an investigation into what is actually happening on the ground? I actually know folk myself who work um, for the DWP on the front line who feel that they are being pressurised into sanctioning more people. Will you agree uh, to carry out an investigation into these uh, well, practices? Well, I'd certainly be willing to meet with you and those individuals, and we can do that in a very, a, on, on a confidential, a, a confidential uh, basis. I, I've... Obviously, I've previously undertaken to meet directly with, ev with, with people who've given a, uh, evidence a, to th this committee, but I have taken direct evidence myself from meeting people within DWP offices, speaking openly and frankly with them, and the, that is not the picture that, it, that is reflected to me. Do you think that some uh, DWP uh, officials on the front line are scared um, to actually say what they think and feel at some of these meetings that you have attended? I hope they're not. I, I hope they're not too, but I recognise that many of them are. 
What, I've, well, you, I've offered in, I've offered in the, you, I, I've, you, I've offered you in my one of my previous responses to meet with you and and the people that you've uh, you've identified who I, I, I would have, would have thought you know would feel uh, your presence would uh, uh, ensure a sort of safe uh, discussion and I, I, I'm very happy uh, I'm very happy to do that but I don't have any I don't have any evidence myself that that is happening. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of these folk don't feel safe at this moment in time, and I don't think my presence or anybody else's presence would actually make them feel any safer, as to be said. Can I ask you again, Minister, will you agree um, to carry out an independent investigation into what has been uh, stated by many, many witnesses to this committee uh, that there is a, tar a, a target policy in place by the DWP? There is no target policy in place. I am absolutely clear uh, on that. OK, let's move on, because we're not going to uh, get a, a, a realistic answer there. I will be. Um, you made a great play today um, round about um, the uh, situation with housing benefit uh, and sanctions. Can I ask you, Minister, why is it um, that it is only now um, that the uh, government... Uh, and the DWP um, are actually signposting uh, folks who have been sanctioned to let them know um, that they can still get housing benefit. And why is it, Minister, um, that when that sanction is uh, put in place, that these folks have to uh, go and reapply um, for that housing benefit? And could it not, would it not be simpler? Um, to uh, just uh, do away with the stopping of housing benefit when a sanction uh, comes into play? Uh, there are complicated processes with, with the passporting of benefits, but one of, the real, one of the real positives about universal credit is that when universal credit is in place, uh, that with, with, with the package of uh, benefits, a uh, housing benefit wouldn't... A, uh, uh, th there wouldn't be any disruption to, um, ho uh, to housing benefit if someone uh, was sanctioned. So I think that is an example of if you bring together uh, a joined-up uh, approach, then you can uh, mitigate uh, the difficulties. But these, you know, we, we can't sit here and pretend that these aren't complex systems, computer systems, a, uh, delivery systems. We're looking very much to get local authorities and the DWP to work much close, more closely together. That's very much to be a, uh, welcomed that, that that's happening, and, and this is part of that. So can I ask you then, in terms of guidance that has been uh, given to the DWP um, and local authorities on this matter, what, what guidance has been put out um, by the government in that regard to ensure that folk are told that they uh, have to reapply for their housing benefit when they have been sanctioned? We're in a, we're in a direct dialogue with uh, local authorities, which, is, as I've reported back to this committee, what, what, what we guidance? are... We've, we've put out, oh. Minister, we put out guidance to, to our staff who are involved in dealing with people who are sanctioned to make sure they tell people they need to reapply and contact the local authority um, to make sure the housing benefit isn't stopped. So, so that's something we have done. I think many people already knew that before, but it's something we have done in the light of evidence we've got over the last few months that there was a problem in that area. So when did that guidance get, Mr Serrell? Uh, I can get you the date of that, but I, I haven't uh, got the date to hand. OK. Um, and to local authorities, guidance to them on this issue, what has the DWP done well, in that local regard? Authorities, local authorities, and the passport you point that the Minister made, I think it's much simpler to have a system where if someone gets job seekers allowance and is entitled to housing benefit, it's automatically passported. Uh, and therefore, it's very difficult to, to not have a system that that's not switched off um, if someone's job seekers allowance stops. So the, the key thing is to get that communication between DWP officials and the local authority and the individual in the local authority at that point at which the sanction uh, kicks in. It's not something the local authority can do unilaterally because it needs to know what's happening at the DWP end. Yes, I understand all of that. Good. But um, what guidance has been given to local authorities and why is it that this uh, only seems to be being communicated now 
to DWP staff, and by the sounds of it, I'm not entirely convinced that it has been communicated to local authorities. Um, why is it only now, after these regimes that, that have been in place for a long time, why is it only now that this is happening? It's happened recently because we've become aware of the evidence around it being a problem recently. I think in the great majority of cases, it actually hasn't been a problem, but in some cases it has. Um, as I say, the key thing is for the, lo for the DWP staff uh, who are dealing with, with the customer, the claimants, at the point they're sanctioned to make sure they're aware of the need to contact the local authority. The local authority itself can't do anything without that connection between, with, the, with the claimant with DWP. Um, they, they can't act unilaterally because there is a passport between the two benefits. Convener, I think it's extremely important that uh, this committee um, is privy to the dates of that guidance going out and what has gone out um, to DWP officials in the front line uh, and also what has uh, or has not gone out to local authorities uh, because I, I, I find it a little bit bizarre that today um, we're, we're having a, a, a huge play of this when you know, many of us have recognised that this has been a problem for some time. Well, I, think we'll I find that very interesting, Mr Stewart, that you, 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 we come to the committee, we listen to, it, we listen to concerns that are expressed, for, ex, expressed uh, by the people that we speak to, we do something about it, and we're criticised for that too. I mean, you can't have it both ways. You can't criticise us for not listening, but, and then you can't, and then criticise us for listening and doing something about issues well, but my, rather, that, that, that are highlighted us to us. I mean, I, I, I think that's just uh, my, my, my problem with all of this, uh, Minister, is that the government tends to close the stable door after the horse is bolted. Well, well I think I think you find that that might apply to. Uh, if you're making that generalisation to all a, uh, governments. Okay, I think we'll move on and go to Claire to be followed by Annabel. Okay, thank you, Convener. Um, you mentioned that you thought that the uses of food banks were varied and complex, but um, without doubt from my own experience as a parliamentarian, um, the increase in food bank use absolutely shows that poverty and hardship have increased however the variety of complexity and varied that might be. Um, can I draw your attention to an article in The Guardian last week um, regarding the social policy study of academics from the LSE, Manchester and York Universities, entitled Poorest Worst Hit by Reforms? And this significant piece of work actually shows that in their analysis, poorer population groups have been the most affected by direct tax and benefit changes. And in fact, the savings made from changes to benefits have been offset by expenditure and direct tax reductions further up the income distribution, meaning that in combination these changes have made no contribution to reducing the deficit or paying down the deficit. Minister, in the face of that evidence, would you agree that austerity has failed and regrettably and disgustingly the poorest in society are the ones who have most proportionately been hit by that process? I don't accept that. But what I do recognise is that in the next 90 days, we'll have the opportunity to debate that, and the people in Scotland and the United Kingdom will be able to make their judgment on the record of this government and the proposals being put forward uh, by other political uh, parties. It will be for the people to make their judgment, not academics, not The Guardian, uh, not uh, third parties. It will be for the people in the ballot box to determine whether they believe that the government's action in relation to uh, our economy was the right course of action or whether, uh, uh, the, whether they subscribe to a view uh, of more tax, more spend and more borrowing. Minister, I, I really find this quite um, disturbing that in the face of all the evidence from this committee's work, from independent academic research, that you're failing to realise that the poorest, most vulnerable people's society are disproportionately affected by the policies of your government. Can I just give you another example? If the freeze and maternity pay goes ahead and the health and pregnancy grant worth £190 to vulnerable people is removed, pregnant women, young families, will be £360 worse off again because of the, the, the policies of, of your government. Do you, the, do you not feel that that is disproportionate, that women and young families are, are bearing the brunt of, of the austerity agenda? I don't accept that women and, and young families are, are, 
a, bearing a, uh, the brunt of a changes because there have been uh, other things which have, have been done to support uh, the income of the most vulnerable. But what I do think is that these, the, these are political uh, arguments uh, for, a, for debate uh, when we get to the general election. And it won't, you know, it's, it's not academics, it's not this committee's report. It's the people who will decide who's right and who's wrong on these issues when they give their verdict. I think it's, it's disappointing to hear that, given that your um, opening premise to this was about speaking to the food bank people is that we should keep politics out of this and we should actually be looking at how we can tackle what is obviously to everyone, to the dogs in the street, an increase in poverty and hardship in this country. I, I think it's hardly surprising that we've had uh, an increase in, in poverty and hardship. We've, we have had the biggest recession in 100 years. That was inevitably going to cause enormous ramifications. Instead of putting uh, our head in the sand in relation to that, the UK government has faced up to it, taken very difficult decisions. And I don't, uh, I, I don't for one minute... I suggest that some of the decisions that have been taken have been difficult for uh, individuals who have been affected, but have been willing to take the difficult decisions to get the economy back onto the right track because we, ex we believe, and I believe it is evidenced, that a successful economy is the best way to take people into work and out of poverty. I go, go back to the opening quote from the, the, the newspaper. These changes have made no contribution to reducing the deficit and paying down the debt. It's failed. I don't accept that, and there'll be plenty of opportunity for that to be debated in the next 90 days and for the public to give uh, their verdict rather than The Guardian. I think we need to move on. And I can I remind colleagues that we're actually here to discuss the reports on food banks and uh, sanctions. Okay, um, Annabel. Uh, thank you, Convener. <clears throat> uh, I would start just with the last observation, Minister, um, because I think all round this table in the committee there would be unanim unanimity about one thing. We'd love to be in a discussion where we're not discussing um, people requiring to rely on welfare um, support. We'd love to be in a situation where uh, sanctions are not applied because the numbers requiring welfare have dramatically reduced. But it seems to me that we are in a situation where there is some hope, because my understanding is that um, the economy in Scotland is growing. My understanding is that since 2010, employment in Scotland is up by 175,000. Unemployment is down by 61,000. And perhaps most encouragingly of all, workless households are down by 93,000. So what I think unanimously around this table we would like to see, there is maybe some real prospect of achieving, but given where we are, which is a situation where, as various committee members have identified, uh, we have welfare claimants, they have to work with the system and they have to deal with the system. I was struck by something you said earlier, which was this, had we any sensible or constructive suggestions about how, in the practical term, we might manage sanctions better. As far as I can gather, there is political unanimity about the principle of having to have sanctions and conditionality. I haven't heard anybody object to that. It seems to be the issue under discussion is how, in a humane and compassionate manner, you then um, manage the exercise of that, of that policy. And I simply wondered, in your engagement with these many groups of people to whom you referred, Minister, did any suggestions come forward, either from them or indeed from your meetings with DWP, about anything that might be done to improve the awareness of claimants, that sanctions were a danger that they could be looming? Certainly when I met with uh, the City of uh, Glasgow Council, uh, they, for example, uh, gave... Uh, uh, some examples of work that they do with younger, uh, with younger people in terms of not just in terms of uh, obviously of supporting them uh, with skills uh, to be able to move into uh, work, but also in terms of just uh, a clearer a uh, um, understanding and approach. Uh, to uh, the, the benefit system. I, I think that's being pursued by uh, a number of other uh, local authorities. And, and uh, you know, I think it is about uh, local authorities, about the DWP, uh, 
the Scottish Government and indeed the, the DWP to the extent, you know, all coming, you know, coming together with a collective purpose, which is to move people into work. That is a collective purpose. You know, it, 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 the impression can be created that the whole purpose of the DWP uh, in Scotland is to sanction as many people as possible. People go to work with the idea how many people can be sanctioned today. It absolutely is not the case. The DWP people I meet regularly, their purpose is to get as many people as they can into work because they know that is the best way to improve their lives. Councils and uh, other agencies can work together along with the sort of the, the voluntary agencies and groups. And I think the one, you know, one thing that, ha that, that, that does happen at food banks or indeed where you know, meals are provided is it is a very good point to allow an intervention to understand what the whole range of issues that an individual uh, might be facing. Now, we don't want them to get to the food bank when... For, pre that intervention but we've got to uh, have a better way of understanding the myriad of issues and crises that people are facing and that's clear in the uh, in the Trussell Trust report even uh, in Ms McKelvey's questions that you know that people who are often sanctioned have a range of other issues uh, that, that are, are, are behind that, people who are waiting benefit payments or indeed people who, who may be short of income. Uh, and, and we need to, to put in place, uh, with all the agencies, the, the, the support that cuts across that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Joan to be followed by Margaret. Thank you, convener. Uh, Mr Mundell, you, you, you asked for examples and I wanted to, to mention a few from your own constituency. Um, over, over a year ago you um, opened the food bank in Peoples mm -hmm. and when you did so you said you were proud to open the food bank. Why did you say you were proud to open the food bank? I was asked uh, as, uh, uh, the, to do so because I, 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 I commend the efforts of the people that came together, the, tr the Trussell Trust, the, the volunteers in Peoples that came together to do that. I would be proud to open a hospital, Joan, but I don't want to see people being ill. It's one of these things that's just so, so you know, just going back to my uh, comments, it's just so gl sort of glib politics to say, oh, he was proud to open a food bank, he must think food banks are a good idea. I don't, but I do commend the volunteers, the Trussell Trust, the people that work to help others. Okay, I, I accept that. One of those volunteers who understand coordinates the People's Food Bank is the Reverend Jim Benton Evans. Now, at the time it was opened, he, he said um, that hunger was, was already a problem. It's going to get worse after April the 1st, after the government's changes to housing benefits. The rug is going to get pulled under from a lot of very vulnerable people. Now, he was quite clearly linking his food bank to the policies of your government. I'm in a, a regular discussion with Jim and all, all pe uh, people and agencies in a, uh, my constituency. I respect the views that, that, that they uh, uh, set out. I listen to them. But I think, as I've said earlier, I don't always agree with what everybody uh, else says. I don't think that we've seen, for example... <coughs> A, um, a changes a coming into place in relation to housing benefit that have, that have uh, had that a, uh, have had that effect. Right. It sounds as if, from the evidence today, that you don't agree with what anyone else says. I, I, I that that is that is not a uh, a uh, the case a, at all. I I'm listening. A, we take action where we identify a, actions that are a, required. I mean, for example, we listened in relation to a, uh, housing benefit payments in uh, rural areas, and there was uh, an increase in, in uh, as you know, a significant increase uh, before the change to the Scottish Government uh, in the level of housing, discretionary housing benefit paid both to Scottish Borders uh, and Dumfries and Galloway uh, Council to take into account the rurality in both those councils. In terms of listening to another person, I've got an email here from Sue Irvin, who runs Dumfries and Galloway um, Citizens Advice Service. And she says, our experience of referring people for emergency food is the main 
is that in the main, around sanctions, it's around sanctions and low wages. Sanctions are clearly related to welfare reform and clearly related to uh, emergency food. Is Sue Irvin of Dumfries and Galloway uh, Citizens Advice wrong when she says that? I, th I think we've, I, we've I, I acknowledged in my opening remarks that the three issues most commonly raised in relation a, uh, to a food banks were sanctions, a, delays in benefit payments, and a, uh, and in a, uh, and low incomes. So, th th a, what I, I, I don't I, I don't accept that those three issues are welfare. Uh, reform. I think that term uh, is bandied uh, is bandied about a little bit uh, too much. But I, you know, we've, I, I set that out in my remarks. You've, you've got a table in spite in your spice a, uh, a briefing. A, um, you know, we're having a discussion about those three. You know, so about you're, three you're issues. saying that uh, that you believe that sanctions are related to the rise of food banks. No, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that the three issues that, have, that, are, uh, that are most often highlighted in respect of the use uh, of uh, food banks are, are the ones that I've set out. What I've said as well, however, is that I believe that it is much more complicated uh, than that. And I think that is evidenced by the, the Trussell Trust report and other, uh, other uh, documentation that show that there are a lot of complicated uh, issues that that can be hi behind uh, those three uh, uh, those three headlines. Okay. Well, just to, to go into some of those co complexities, um, one of the other organisations that distributes food in your constituency is uh, First Base, um, and they distribute food parcels about fi 500 upwards across uh, Dumfries and Galloway. One of the areas that they distribute to is Kirkconnell and Kelholm in, in your constituency in Upper Nithsdale. And Mark Franklin, who runs First Base, has written quite extensively about his work in these former mining villages of Mid and Upper Nithsdale. Now, he uh, explains that there are about 300 unemployed men and women in, in the village, um, and many of them don't have access to broadband. Uh, however, they're expected to go online uh, and leave digital evidence of 17 job searches each and every week. Now, in those villages, there are only 15 publicly available computers for 300 people who are on unemployment benefit or, or who are unemployed and expected to make those searches by the Department of Work and, and Pensions. And he then asks, is it any wonder that they're failing? Is it any wonder that they're failing to make the contacts and they're being sanctioned? There's a very clear example. He says that in his work in Mid and Upper Nisdale, he's seen <coughs> an increase in sanctions because of these demands by the Department of Work and Pensions. Well, for reasons we won't go into in this committee, it won't surprise you to, to know that I take what Mr. Franklin says with a pinch of salt. However, a, it is a serious a, uh, a, uh, issue in terms of, of, of the isolation of, of Upper Nisdale. That's why we've worked with the DWP to ensure that, for example, claimants can go to Cumnock rather than to Dumfries, for which there, there, there are much a uh, more difficult uh, transport links. That's why the DWP come a, uh, to a, uh, the, the Upper Nithsdale a, uh, communities on a regular a, uh, basis to meet a, with a, uh, to meet with the applicants to look to, to give them all the help uh, and support uh, that they can uh, into uh, in, into work and that there's a lot being done and, and to demonstrate non-partisan uh, ship, Mr. Convener, I pay tribute to the Labour councillor uh, for uh, the Kirkconnell and Kellahome area, John Syme, because he is a tireless uh, worker. To, to get people in the community into work, to get them all a, uh, the help a, 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 and, and support they can. But if there are any concrete examples of people who've been sanctioned for not having access to broadband, then let, let's, let's know and let's, a, uh, let, let's deal with that, because that's not acceptable to me. Yeah, I'm, I'm surprised you made that comment about Mr Franklin. He has been working in a voluntary capacity distributing food banks for a number of years and helping veterans. So whatever his political views might be, um, I'm sure that you would pay credit to his charity work. I think Mark uh, has uh, done a lot of very good uh, work 
uh, particularly with uh, drug uh, users. But we could, ha uh, having been a very, very prominent yes campaigner, uh, I, I don't think that we could uh, necessarily take everything that he says as totally objective. And I don't think that he, I don't think that he himself would hold himself out in that regard. I, 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 would take, I would take issue with that. I think um, you know many people who work in food banks come from all sorts of um, different backgrounds, and the people who have contributed evidence to this committee weren't all yes campaigners or even yes voters, Indeed. but they are absolutely adamant that there is a link between food banks and sanctions. I, I, I accept that. I, I, I've, I've just... I've just caveated what my, my I've caveated Mr. Franklin's contribution, but uh, that doesn't mean that I disrespect the contributions that, that others ha others have, have made, and I, I respect his contribution in a whole range of areas of civic uh, life in Dumfries and Galloway. But I don't necessarily accept that, that everything that he says is wholly objective. I think many people will be very, very disappointed to hear you say that. As a result of my uh, observation of uh, First Base's work in Dumfries and Galloway um, and the clear link uh, between the people that I saw collecting food parcels and who were sanctioned, I wrote to your colleague um, Esther McVeigh in the Department of Work and Pensions and she refuted every single one of the points that I made. One of the points that she made is that there is no robust evidence that welfare reforms are linked to the increased use of food bank. Do you agree with her, yes or no? I think I made very clear the conveners asked the same question. We're not going to agree on that. We're not going to, we're not going to agree on that. That's going to be a matter that's going to be a matter of political a, uh, of, of political debate. You do agree with Esther McVeigh that there's no link between welfare reforms and food banks? Yes if no? you're using the, uh, you're using if you're using the expression welfare reforms, uh, then then no, I don't accept uh, that. I've set out the I've set out the issues that I think have been clearly uh, discussed in the context uh, of. Uh, of food bank usage, but we're just we're just not going to agree. We have to take these debates and discussions to uh, uh, the electorate, and, and they'll determine uh, what what the what the outcome is. But when we get to that point, you and your colleagues will have to set out what your policies are. Do you support conditionality or not? Margaret, finally. Thank you. And, uh... Yes, it's been a, a very interesting debate this morning, um, although there hasn't been a lot of answers um, coming <coughs> from that. Um, you know, if you're not prepared to take the evidence that has been given in reports from academics or from the likes of Oxfam, perhaps you take the evidence from your colleagues in the House of Commons in their report on Feeding Britain, where they have said that Benefit-related problems was the single biggest reason given for food bank referrals by almost every food bank that presented evidence to them. And so, you know, what has happened since then? And also on the housing benefit uh, issue, you know, when you were saying you have been making changes because... Following on from that report, which was uh, reported on the 8th of December, the Feeding Britain, Dun Ian Duncan Smith said he was looking at how sanctioned claimants that lose job seekers allowance need not lose housing benefit as well. And that was in December. So what has so it was still happening then. So what has happened in the meanwhile? I think we're asking for clear evidence that actually some action has been taken to stop because it's been happening. People have been losing their housing benefit because they were sanctioned or taken off job seekers allowance. So, you know, I think it's only fair that you could give us some evidence that you have taken some clear action to, to change what's happening here. And um, also, you have said that you have met with Oxfam and others, British Medical Association, Bernardo's um, what discussion did you have with them regarding their report? Uh, you know, where they're saying that half to two thirds of food bank users who took part in the report ending up that there was a uh, 28 to 34 percent were waiting for benefit claims, which had not been decided on, and 19 to 28 percent 
had been sanctioned. So surely um, they gave you some evidence when you met with them on uh, these issues. They did. Gi they, they, they did give me evidence, and, and, and we've spoken about a. Uh, we've spoken about the issues that have been highlighted. We've had a very, uh, w you know, we've we've had a very full uh, discussion about a uh, sanctions. A, uh, we've we've had a, a discussion about benefit a delay, and. We've had, a, you know, clearly we've, we've touched on issues um, that, that, that relate more widely to a low income. A, and a, uh, I, as you would expect from what I've said previously, uh, you know, made it clear to Oxfam and all the people that I met that we will look at any individual case of anybody who has been unjustly or unfairly uh, sanctioned. That remains. Uh, that, that offer remains on, on the table and I'll, we'll see that we can get our uh, communication examples. flow. Hmm? Surely you've had examples well, we've, we've, know, we've, in we've, the period. We've, 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 we've had some examples, but, I, but uh, we've had some examples, but not, you know, not a large number. Uh, now, that's not, I'm, I, as I said in my opening remarks, I'm not saying that that means that there aren't such people, but let's, you know, let's have, have the detailed examples. Let's work, a, uh, let's work through that because it's been, I think it has been established around this table that everybody accepts that there's a need for sanctions and it's just how uh, that sanctions a process is applied. We want to have a, a transparent and a fair and a consistent approach that's understood by uh, claimants and by a DWP staff. That's our uh, that's our objective. We've set out, as, as Pete Sells indicated, uh, uh, clarity uh, because uh, uh, having listened, that there wasn't sufficient clarity in relation to short-term uh, benefit advances, in terms uh, of hardship payments, and in terms of of the housing benefit process. Because uh, you, you don't lose housing benefit by being sanctioned, and we, we just, that everybody just has to be uh, absolutely clear about that and make sure uh, that, that that isn't happening a, uh, to, to in, in, in individuals. So, your know, actions have, a, have been taken. We're still, a, we're still a listening. You know, we're still uh, communicating. At the end of the day, you know, we, uh, as I've said, we do have to accept you know, there are some areas in which we are not going to we're not going to reach agreement, and those are areas which are then subject, you know, to political uh, debate at, at election time. Well, I mean, you're politicising it by saying that because, I mean, it's clear from all the evidence that we've heard today and the previous evidence that there is a direct correlation between the welfare reforms and the use in food banks. Uh, can I perhaps go on to a sort of different aspect of it? I mean, I'm looking okay. at the Trussell Trust table here on why do people use food, food banks this winter. And it's interesting to, to notice the figures on the benefit delays and just a huge difference in these. Um, for in TAIN, 47% and in um, Dingwall, 41%. Badenoch and Strathspey, 44%. You know, in other places like Aberdeen, 16%. And in Glasgow South East, it's 15%. But in Wigtonshire, 74% of people using food banks this winter is because of benefit delays. Could you perhaps tell me why there's such a difference in these percentages and why people that seem to be in more remote areas mm -hmm. are uh, having to go to food banks, and obviously it's more difficult for them to reach food banks as well. I think Pete's going to ask, no, um, I don't have those figures in front of me, but I think I'm very happy to look at those particular areas and, and what the benefit payments, benefit processing times are in relation to those particular areas. But I don't. I think one has to recognise that how how people come to ascribe um, referrals to benefit delays is not the most rigorous process necessarily. Um, it's the assessment of the individual who's making the referral for good reasons, I'm sure, but it will vary quite greatly between different individuals how they how they ascribe a particular reason for referral. So, uh, you know, it could be that different areas would have different stats 
more because of um, the nature of the people making the referrals rather than if you're waiting on the your benefit, you're waiting on your benefit. I don't see what's, what's hard about that. But no. as the minister said up front, there are a range of complex range of, of things going on <coughs> around food banks and going on in people's lives that lead to a referral to food bank. It's rarely just one thing. Actually, it's a range of different things. Um, uh, some of those uh, referral processes had the individuals making the assessment, making the referral, put down one reason, when in fact I suspect there's, there's often a lot more than one reason behind something. Um, the minister also talked about um, benefit processing times. Uh, as I say, up, said up front, I'm very happy to look at uh, what the stats are in relation to those particular areas, but to be honest, um, benefit processing is done centrally, so I wouldn't expect it to, to vary particularly at that local level. Bill, I mean... I'm sure you'll get a copy of this table. Yeah, no, I've got it already, and it does make interesting reading, and it does look like it's uh, the more remote areas uh, are taking longer to process benefits. For what reason, I don't know, but particularly if it's centralised. And perhaps in the rural areas, there's, um, there's an opportunity to do even more awareness about the short-term benefit advance, which people, you know, if they've made a new claim to benefit, they will get that. You know, it's paid in arrears, as we touched on earlier. Mm -hmm. Um, and perhaps some people in those areas, in particular locations, we can work you know, together locally in the community to make sure that people have a greater awareness of, of the ability to request a short-term benefit advance if, if they don't have that money. Well, could you come back to the committee with the reasons <coughs> for um, these donations? Yeah, I, 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 absolutely. I mean, I, I give you an absolute commitment. I mean, there should not be undue um, delay in, in just because somebody is living in a rural area. That's not acceptable, mm. and uh, it, it can't be tolerated. Okay. At that point, I just have to thank you, Minister, for staying with us. Um, you stayed beyond what we had agreed, and I appreciate you, you doing that. Uh, I think we interrogated the, the subject quite intensively, and I do appreciate the fact that we had agreed in advance how, how long we would be, but you've uh, allowed us to go beyond that, so I, I do appreciate you giving us additional time to what we had already uh, discussed. There are a few things, obviously, that have come out this morning that we'll have to follow up uh, in terms of communication between the, ourselves and, and your officials and yourself um, but we will uh, discuss that when we go into private session but uh, on behalf of the committee uh, thank you for coming in front of us and uh, answering the questions that unfortunately we remain unable to put to your colleagues uh, Mr Duncan Smith, uh, Ms McVeigh and the Lord Freud so please convey to them uh, our invitation to sit in your seat at some point and and answer the questions directly that they're answerable for. Uh, we certainly make them welcome. We coffee here for them as well. Um, and uh, with that, I'd like to thank you, if you uh, for well, coming. I, 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 th I mean, I thank you. We, you know, there are clearly there are areas where we're not going to we're not going to be in agreement. But I do I welcome the opportunity for dialogue. I think dialogue between this committee and the joint ministerial uh, working group is a good way. Uh, forward, if there is any, uh, obviously we have a short period now until the, the election process begins, but you know, I welcome a proactive approach from, from you in relation to that uh, process and I undertake to, uh, from a UK government point of view, keep you, uh, you know, advised of our uh, deliberations and to engage with you. Okay, thanks very much Minister and with that we go into the, the private session as we had agreed earlier and I'll close the meeting to the public.